Just left Derek's house, and I was telling him he has bigs in the backyard. Look at the mountain. <laughs> that is my right, backyard. Right behind his house. Yeah, up on this bench in the area where he lives, uh, four people, three of them teenagers, one of them adult, playing a soft gun game. They had a, a a pretty long Bigfoot encounter, in my opinion, as far as Bigfoot encounters go. Repeat offender came back after I walked away. Yup. And then this pass we're going over at the top of the pass, there's two sighting reports of it crossing the road right there. One time, uh, one time with snow banks on either side that leaked the road, and the other time it was during a season with no snow and it just crossed the road. One with the snow banks was a daytime sighting, the other one was a, a nighttime sighting. Um, the, I'm, yeah, the nighttime sighting, uh, they were coming this direction up on the top. And the guy driving thought it was a prank. He thought some idiot was in a Bigfoot costume crossing the road. And he's thinking, you know, damn, I almost hit the dude. How dangerous, you know. So he's yelling out the window at him. And it turns out it just sprinted right up the thick, thick mountainside. And when he got, you know, when he was yelling at it up the mountain, he realized how big it was. And then... Oh my gosh, you know, a person without a suit would not be able to run up the mountain as well and easily as it did. And that's when him and the passenger realized it wasn't a prank. And then they cross past the parking lot. There's a trailhead parking lot at the top, and there's not a single car in the parking lot. So no cars up there. So anyway, even though they thought it was a prank in the beginning, in the end, they, were, they, they took it seriously. And then off to our right, the next canyon over is called Coldwater Canyon. And that Coldwater Canyon, it uh, drains down into um, the North Ogden Trout Farm. And a lot of vocalizations have been reported out of the canyon where the Cold Creek comes out of. And then that's the water that the trout farm uses for their trout farm. And uh, the guy that owned that trout farm in the 80s he had a couple of uh, Bigfoot sightings there one of them uh, he claims it was eating the fish out of his trout farm and uh, the one time he saw it, that it was still on fish out of the trout farm he called the authorities and they come and inspected the footprints and everything one of the footprints he cast and the authorities kept it for a little while and he finally demanded it back it's like that was on my property I cast it it's mine and bring it back, you know. So he got his cast back from him. Nobody's been able to explain that one. Um, matter of fact, uh, I got, uh, one of the people that do what we currently do back then, um, I don't think it was David Carver, it was, uh, or maybe it was him. But anyway, a uh, group of guys that were into Bigfooting like we are now back then, they followed the tracks in the mud and the dirt and everything up the mountain uh, close to a cave. I don't I don't know if they saw the prints going in and out of the cave, but it was close to a cave up on the mountain. That was during a point in time. There was tons of Bigfoot sightings down in the valley, like, like a Bigfoot or a group of them come down looking for resources and the early 80s, like 80, 81. That's when my sighting happened. Yep, down in the valley too. <laughs> yep. yep, and that's when I saw a footprint just a few miles from where Derek had his sighting. And the, the footprint was actually, it was more than one footprint, there were several footprints actually. And um, I wasn't buying the fact that it was Bigfoot. I thought it was a really big person walking around in the mud, ice. I don't think there was, I, I don't recall any snow on the ground. I just remember it was cold enough to put um, paper thin ice on top of uh, water puddles and stuff and it had actually stepped into one of them breaking through and I saw the muddy brands and I'm like, I'm like, what weirdo is walking around 
the middle of nowhere without shoes on or possibly no clothes. What's going on here? And then when I heard about Derek's sighting a few miles from there, I was like, oh, that wasn't a big weird person. I was imagining someone the size of Shagill on Gill running around in the cold and the mud without their shoes on. You know, because at that point in time, I didn't realize that there was a lot of Bigfoot sightings in Utah. And, and this is down in the valley. It was near the 10-acre um, farm that I grew up on. I was just out with my BB gun shooting things up on a, a neighboring farm. And it was actually, uh, I can't really even call it a farm, a, a, a farmer, rancher, whatever, owned it. And he never did anything with it. He didn't even graze cattle in it. He just let it be the cottonwoods, uh, Russian olives. Um, he had a slough that ran through the property. And I think, the, I think the Bigfoot was probably interested in following the slough. And we just went over the top where the two crossings were up there. Okay, and then last uh, winter, down in the valley down here, a guy on a late Sunday morning, so daytime siding, saw the Bigfoot cross his road down here as he was backing out his driveway to go to church. There's lots of rivers, ponds, and a, and a lake down here. And then the mountains across the way, we're heading to the top of those mountains over there, the Monte Cristo region to surface some game cameras. That's what I picked Derek up for today. This is kind of showing you our uh, backyard, the Bigfoot history of our backyard. And Monte Cristo is probably where uh, our furthest game cameras back is probably about 65 miles from Derek's house. I think so. I GPS um, the uh, getting to the gate from my house, and uh, getting to the gate from my house is about thirty miles. It's a seasonal gate. You'd be about right. Then. Down at that Flats, and then from that gate, I believe um, our furthest game camera back I measured it on GPS is about thirty-five miles. There's been a couple of winters we've caught snowmobilers back there. And I'm like, wow, because, I mean, that gate's about as close as you can get when they close it off. So those guys traveled like 35 miles on their snowmobiles to be saw back there in the wintertime. So they're, that's avid in my opinion, avid snowmobiler. Yeah, that's long. That they, would suck hard if you're, I imagine your machine broke down. I'm at, I imagine they probably have um, um, property cabins or whatever up close to there. So Worst case scenario. So they're probably, you know, snowmobile in, stay at the cabins and mess around for the weekend. Yeah. Kind of like we used to do at Mannerlands. In this valley I'm taking you guys into, there's at least a dozen Bigfoot sighting reports that I know of. At reports least. on paper and then, uh, and then the word of mouth ones. Like the guy that, the guy that had his uh, road crossing last year. He didn't report it to anybody that was going to put it out to the public for him. We just talk about it. There's probably 90% more word of mouth sightings than would actually make it onto a, an official website. And because we are from here, we heard a lot of the word of mouth ones going around. Yeah. 
just found out a guy I work with works in a, another project that owns 40 acres over by just over here on the hillside. Oh, he does? Yeah, he does. 40 acres? So I need wow. To, I need to chat with that guy. I would imagine he has some stories. Well, yeah, that, said his, off to our right, that's where the babysitter had the big foot come up onto the porch and mess yeah. around with the door. Yeah. His, uh, his son is always out. I mean, he's a, just a bow hunter. Always out on horseback. But, uh, he had, he had dropped a really nice looking four point. He showed me pictures, um, that he had shot it and they had taken off and they had tracked it down into the neighborhood, man. Ended up crossing his bishop's driveway and heading back down through another the backyard and into some other people and by the time they had caught it or got up to it um fish and game and uh cops had actually shown up because it had dropped dead just behind somebody's driveway they were having a wedding they were having a wedding oh, out no. there yeah so it kind of turned this season hey, it was all right. yeah it was just it just happened you know it was a couple weeks ago he was over just telling me about it and stuff, so. Was that a bow? I, yeah, that was with a bow. So, uh, so I, his I mean, family, he it shot was, it on his 40 acres of property? Yeah, and fishing, fishing game, actually. Um, just, to, just to verify it, they backtracked the actual blood trail back to where he had actually shot it just to make sure that he was legal shooting it where he shot it, which it, he was. So... Anyway, I, I would imagine they got some stories because he's lived up here almost his whole life. So yeah, I, I, it might be able to point us to someone that's had an experience. Yeah, so you know, and I just just barely found out that you know he actually lived up here. He comes and asks me for help all the time, or hardware and stuff. So I'm constantly, constantly. In fact, he gave me crap. He was like, "You're self-sufficient, man." I'm always over here asking you for help, and you never come and ask me for help. So that just sets me up to say, hey, you might be able to help me out in something else. <laughs> See if he's got some stories to tell or point me in the right direction. Keep a game camera up on his property. Does he yeah, does yeah. He border, I, in uh, fact, I bet you. Does he border National Forest or anything? I, you know, I'm not positive. 40 not, acres is a big chunk. That is a big chunk, especially up here. That's a big chunk worth a lot of money, actually. Yeah, we have uh, 10 acres on Cedar Mountain, and that's that's a good-sized lot of property. So it is. Four times four that times size. Quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I don't think it's been in his family forever and ever. I don't think he'll ever let it go. Jeez. Yeah, he should hang on to it. I would. It's a nice, nice valley. I would. There'd be no. I could. That would I could be. retire. In this They'd have valley. to take it to me. Take it from me. If I move, this is where I will end up. Yeah, it's close to home, and it's a little bit slower pace, and it's close to the places we like to go. Cleaner air. It's definitely grown a lot since we were kids, though. That's for sure. Yep. Everybody wants to live in the mountains. Now everybody's in the mountains. Now. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, there was hardly any hardly homes any. here. There was a few farms and... Nothing like it is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they say this place is probably going to be the next park city. would surprise me, you got three ski resorts right here. A couple different golf courses. I know, and uh, Powder Mountain's my favorite uh, ski resort I've ever been in my life. And I've been on a lot of them in on a lot of them and it's always a nice one yeah people will uh travel here and they'll go to like uh snow basin because that's where the giant slalom was in the 2002 olympics so you know kind of put this place on paper and people come ski there and stuff and every once in a while i'll run into someone from out of state somewhere and they'll hear where i'm from and they're like oh i've been uh, skiing snow basin and i'm like you need to try powder mountain i like them both there's nothing wrong with it, but I love Powder Mountain. I think it's more diverse. It's a wider span on skill level. We usually start these roundtables when we go to 
service the cameras when we're a lot closer to the cameras but I kind of wanted to give you guys a tour of Biggs in the backyard of Derek's house to where we're actually going pretty close to this stretch where we're at the the church no longer exists it was uh, it burnt down and has since been removed and new building development but when the church was there uh, a couple of women in their car um, had a Bigfoot sighting at night and the Bigfoot was pacing the side of their car I was gonna say that one wasn't exactly a road crossing because it didn't cross the road they saw it, it kind of the, on the, the they saw it on the corner by the church and brought their attention to it and then it started pacing their cars they tried to pass it and you know really freaked them out understandable yeah that would be kind of creepy it's creepy enough just to see one let alone having it pacing and tracking you down i know where you live i smell you in front of us those peaks over there with snow on them that's the snow basin area quite a few bigfoot sightings up over there too yep wheeler canyon leading up to it some of the most intense Bigfoot sightings that happened down in there. There's a few homes at the mouth of that. There's one house that had problems with uh, one looking in a window that's far too tall for a normal person to look through. Matter of fact, uh, chased him out of the house. Matter of fact, a uh, woman that called the police to come investigate the first time that she had saw one. She reported it as a prowler because she knew if she told them, you know, I think I saw Bigfoot, they wouldn't show up. So she told them that she had a prowler, and uh, the cop that eventually showed up, he was six foot seven. And That's a big cop. Yeah, and he was like, That's the, window, a big the window that it was looking in through, he couldn't look in through it. And, you know, the top of his head's like at the bottom of the window, and he's just like, oh. You got a pretty big prowler, cause you know she, it, its face filled the window. You know, it was like a 12 by, 12 inch by 12 inch window, and its face filled the window, staring in the house. It's not a very big window, though. No, it's not a very big window, but, but it, and it was a high window. I think the window was all about letting light into the hallway. It was uh, but, but it, it was where you, filled? it's where you come down to the second floor down the stairwell yeah, yeah. and then and and as you're heading straight down the first flight of stairs it's right there I think it's just a picture window to let light in and uh, not really for looking out or anything and the Bigfoot was tall enough that his face filled the window and the six foot seven cop couldn't look through the window so I'm just telling you the Bigfoot was the taller Bigfoot. than he was yeah yeah, she called the police because the creature kept walking around the perimeter of her house and she could feel it touching some of the windows. And her husband worked out of town, so her and her son was home alone. So she called the cops. And then uh, that week she moved out. She called and told her husband what happened and stuff, and he didn't believe her. She's like, I don't care whether you believe me or not, I'm out of here. And he, he lived there another six months before they uh, finally sold the place. Before he moved out, um, he woke up one morning, dogs freaking out, out on the back porch. And so he went out to bring the dog in and see why it was freaking out. And the Bigfoot standing on his back porch, morning daylight. So yeah, he had to, he had to eat crow and apologize to her. I could just wanted some coffee. <laughs> but that's that's one of my favorite Bigfoot sightings that happened in this valley. Yeah. That's actually pretty dang pretty dang close to your house actually. Not as probably closer to your house than mine. Or about halfway in between. Yeah, it was right between. That's a uh, that's a pretty popular hiking canyon right now. Back when her Bigfoot um, sighting, both those people's Bigfoot sightings happened. It was actually a camping canyon. People were able to drive in and there was uh, paid campsites and stuff and they've shut all that down and now only allowed daytime hiking. Do we, uh, do we still have Squawks footage up? 
Yep. Um, we actually have aerial footage of that canyon going up and down that canyon. First time we, you ever put a drone in the air for this yep, channel. Yep, it is. It is. Um, whether it's on YouTube or not, it is. It is. It is, and we it's, can put a it's link still on this. our website too, actually. So. Yeah, people uh, snowshoe it and cross country ski it in the winter time. My brother and his wife do all the time. He he skis while she um, does the snowshoeing. Still pretty full. He actually thinks he had a Bigfoot experience uh, back there about five, six years ago when we first really started uh, getting our stuff out there, our research out there on the internet or online. Yeah, him and Allison got a hold of me and was like, hey, we, we think we just had a Bigfoot experience up Weber, Wheeler Canyon and told me all that happened. They didn't see it. They just, it paced the side of them, threw things at them, some vocalizations, scared the crap out of them. And then, um, you know, after I sat and listened to everything, I was, I, I started telling them the history of sightings there and they're like, oh my gosh. A lot of people like this and I'm like yeah but 99.9% .9 of the people never leave that trail and when you get back in there to hike you don't want to leave the trail it's freaking some yeah. thick stuff I know it's a good you hike. Went, I've been back there quite a few times you show in their kids you guys had some stuff thrown at you when you yeah. hiked back there one time I actually had some rocks thrown down on us that was a bit creepy In fact, I think we got video of that. Maybe I'll have to go through my footage. Yeah, Derek. I was thinking we actually had that on video. Though. Derek does, doesn't have as much of his footage posted as he should. I'm a slacker. <laughs> no, it's because I spend all day long on a computer. So do so I. I <laughs> I just get sick and tired. I get sick and tired of the computer too. <laughs> I think I have carpal tunnel in my mouse finger. Oh, I've already had it. I've already <laughs> had it done, man. You had carpal tunnel surgery? I had surgery done. Off to our right, about a mile or two that way, um, that's the last Bigfoot investigation that I've done. A woman uh, that has uh, about 20 acres, well, the woman notified me, it's her whole family that lives there, but they live in a gated community in the mountains off to the right, and she got a hold of me wanting to know how to get rid of a Bigfoot without pissing it off. She, want, she just wants it leaving her property alone, and she does not want to upset it. And, uh, it's been uh, harassing uh, their horses. Um, her daughter at nighttime seen it crawling around in uh, the backyard. And you can't really call it a yard. It's it's the area between the house and the barn and, and the animal enclosure. She saw the Bigfoot like it's army crawling. More like army crawling through the backyard. That's How creepy true. is that? But anyway, they've uh, found the footprints and have some structures on their property and she want to know how to get rid of it without upsetting it. But I'm like, we'll come up and we'll check out the footprints and check out the property and just for the fact someone's looking for it, if it feels like someone's hunting it, that'll get rid of it right there. And she's like, no, my neighbors, this is a gated community. I want to upset the neighbors and invite you guys on and all that. And I'm like... Phew crap and I'm like okay well here's a sure uh, for sure fire way to get rid of the Bigfoot I go put up several game cameras around the property I says I seem to be afraid of game cameras whatever it is the um probably in my opinion the the IR trigger mechanism I said they might avoid your uh, property uh, property entirely I've actually saw it um, way back in Sasquatch Canyon where our furthest cameras are back near the 77 siding location. I had this draw where I always saw the footprints coming in and out down towards the water. So I put up two cameras in different parts of the draw 
and a month or two later when I come up to service them, no footprints anywhere, and I'm like, what the hell? And then I seen where the tracks went completely around the draw and come down another way. So whatever it is about those cameras, it seemed to me like they avoided them completely, quit using the draw. And a lot of people think they can see IR, so maybe they see the IR uh, trigger mechanism. Now saying that, though, you know, there's a possibility Bigfoot knows they're there other than seeing a plastic thing right there. Can you smell it? I'm hoping that um, if, if that's the case, they desensitize to them, so keep them in their area, and then everything makes a mistake. You, you never know. It, it may make a mistake and accidentally trigger a camera and we capture it, or become desensitized and start realizing it's not a threat. That thing has been sitting there for five years. It's not a threat. Not one time has it jumped at me or shot lasers. No, I don't know. But anyway, that's what I told her. Put up a bunch of big game cameras and then I go, hey, and then if you don't scare it off, you got you got proof, you got evidence that everybody's looking for. Not mentioned, it might actually capture a juvenile. Something's just not quite actually, you know, educated with worldly things yet. About a week after she got a hold of me and, you know, wouldn't let us on the property, we come up around here hiking, checking out the area. It was during the salmon run up at Causey, so we also uh, uh, hiked Skull Crack Canyon looking for Bigfoot evidence. Um, when Jenny was uh, in her young 20s, uh, her and Brody and a couple of our other friends found Bigfoot tracks um, up in Skull Crack Canyon during the salmon run. And I've been wanting to hike that for a long time since they found those tracks. And then that lady sighting close by, her and her daughters and family's experience, we headed up to Skull Crack Canyon during the salmon run and, and scoped the area. We'll put that uh, video in the comment section. Yeah, that was one of the few times my daughter actually came. Yeah. That was pretty neat. That's the first time I've seen the um, the lake salmon run. Yeah, that was cool. Not last season, but the season before, right below Skull Crack Canyon, there's a, a camp area. Oh, we're probably about ready to drive past it. It's called Magpie Campground. Yeah, not too far. They not closed it a couple miles. They closed it uh, three weeks early at the end of the camping season because a mountain lion um, killed a deer just opposite side of the river and was and on kept the far coming, side. Yeah, kept coming back to the kill, so they just shut down the the camp area completely the rest of the season. Fall is upon us. Getting us some colors. Hope you guys enjoy our form of a podcast. Magpie, right there. Boop, boop. Something yep. there. This was the campground off to our right that got shut down two seasons ago. Mountain lions in the backyard. Yeah, I guess they felt that the mountain lions' behavior would be a lot more risky coming back and forth to that kill that it had made. I always camped here, South oh, Fork. Oh, yeah, I was going to say you're South Fork, too gates look like they're still open. Yep, gate is open. But I don't think they're being managed right now, so they probably won't charge money. Motorcycle much? Yeah, these guys don't have much longer left. They're getting out while they can. Nice day. It is a nice day. Might be the last time we service these game cameras before winter. Matter of fact, in 45 days, they, oh, sh they sh we already had snow up there a few days ago. It might be muddy up there. I expect it. I think there will be puddles, but I don't think it's going to be muddy. It's been, it was dry leading up to this, so I think the ground will absorb the moisture pretty fast. See more moose up here than I do anywhere else. I see them quite often here.
that canyon off to our right, that's where the school crack canyon was. We hiked. Pizza property up here. Just past the gate, there was a bunch of one acre lots in Aspens that were for sale for uh, 10 grand a, an acre. And gosh, I, I wanted to. I wanted to buy one of them so bad it just was uh, like one of the worst times of my life. Guaranteed it ain't gonna be no ten grand an acre anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, that property all all those lots sold in uh, one year flat. I really think our buddy Scott Green See, bought. I was gonna say Scott I Green. I think he bought one of them. Yeah, he's pretty much got his cabin done, doesn't he? Yeah, he just finished the bathroom on it. had it for a couple of years he just slowly been building on improves it, yeah. it every year yeah he, he's got marble in the bathroom <laughs> in his cabin? Mar marble shower and everything I huh? bet he wants to relocate and just stay there I'm sure it's his, surprise me I'm sure it's his retirement property he gets in there in the winter time too because he's he's big into snowmobiling and it's really not that far from the gate He had to shutter the windows during the winter time, not because of the bears, but um, two seasons ago, the snow got so deep that um, snow sliding off of his roof hit the snow banks because it kind of formed like a, a moat of snow around his cabin. But it slid off the roof, hit the snow banks, and ricocheted back in and in and, and broke some of his windows. It's built up the pressure over time. That sucks. Mm -hmm. So now, now he shutters them during the winter time. But you know, if he hadn't have been able to get in there, you, you went in there in the spring, you would have had no clue that, unless you witnessed what happened. He'd have been like, who broke my windows, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was snow. Yeah, the snow on the top up here, uh, probably gets about eight feet deep on the top every year and I know there's been years where they've measured at 15 feet deep that was uh, in fact it was funny talking about it I remember uh, taking up going up skiing as a kid probably I don't know 12 if that um, we were heading up and it got dropped off and jumped on one of the buses to take you up to Powder Mountain. I remember actually driving through sheer cut snow that was higher than the bus that we were on on both sides of the road. It was just cut out like a tunnel in the snow. That's how deep it was at that point. Um, we're probably a little older than that though probably mid to early 80s mm -hmm. yeah that was cool I know uh, in my late 20s there was a year where we had a lot of snow and up on top of uh, Outer Mountain one of my favorite runs the snow was 15 feet deep up there and that was uh, that was after the the snow cats had uh, had come in and, and groomed it. Yeah. They still were able to push down to the bottom and measure 15 feet of snow. Yeah, a lot of ski resorts in this part of Utah because we do get deep snow in the mountains. And they consider some of the best powder on the planet. Something unique to the Great Salt Lake. Get yeah. real light, fluffy, fluffy powder. It dries out the snow and makes it fluffy going across that salty lake when the storms come in off of them. I know there's I've been there's been times I've been up skiing and people from out of the country is like your snow's just like everyone else, blah 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 and I go, Oh I go, You need to come up here after a storm has rolled off the Great Salt Lake. If the storm comes any other direction. We don't get the famous snow that we're known for. But most of the storms 
that's that's usually the way the jet stream comes yep. in is off of there so and I'll tell you what the resort that are east of that lake get more of that unique snow than other resorts in Utah just to, for the fact that's where most of the storms roll off from is to the east they come in from west to east Yeah, I spent about 10, 12 years where I was skiing at least once a week. Now that's changed. I Bigfoot at least once a week. I just don't think I'm going to find Bigfoot sitting at home watching reruns of Finding Bigfoot. I just don't think it's going to happen that way. There it is. <laughs> Here's a section right here where we see moose a lot. Yeah. That cabin, I've saw a couple of them multiple different times right there, just don't buy that cabin, that property. Jenny and I pulled over close to here one year and started taking pictures of a, a young bull moose, and he got ornery. I actually drove away before we were done taking photos because I thought he was going to start yeah. ramming the car. Gives you an indication when they start getting on it's time to move on. Okay, running, he was back and forth doing uh, pacing, making noises and uh, having his head low and his ears back and his hackles up and I'm like, yeah. yeah it's time to go. <laughs> I'm sure he really ain't going to hurt us in the car but I don't want him to hurt my car. Never know, man. Yep. They take out a window like nothing, nothing else. Might get sideswiped. Knock your crap out. During the rut in Yellowstone, those elk, and some of those bull elk have messed up people's cars and trucks. I get ornery. I put together a sighting report video from. Uh, our expedition to uh, the edge of the river of no return when we went to Deadwood and Stanley and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I put these guys' uh, these deer hunters' uh, Bigfoot sighting report out there where um, they heard it vocalizing. Hey! They heard that vocalization and stuff before they had saw it. And what really intrigues me about the encounter is uh, Jenny and I, a couple of years ago, um, in Yellowstone Canyon in the Uinta Mountains in Utah, we heard the same vocalization. And I I blamed it on a, a person at first. I thought there was a couple of uh, drunk campers working their way down the mountain to um, the only vaulted bathroom, the only public bathroom in the entire 35-mile canyon. But we were using the restroom at night because we were we were camped about five to ten miles away from it. And Jenny and I, after dark, went and used it. And it's a hell of a jaunt to the bathroom. Yep, it's so much nicer than you know. But anyway, log log. <laughs> anyway, they were there sounded like uh, three individuals coming down. Hey, woo, hey back and forth and then every once in a while the one that was going hey he would vocalize directly at us because I don't know if that was a horse or a moose we just saw the back end of it it was big and it was black I just thought it was weird that these people didn't have flashlights whatever so anyway really creeped us out and we headed back to camp and then the next morning we went looking for the people that we thought we're camping up above that draw and realized that we were the only ones uh, that weekend in that that canyon and not only was nobody camping up in that draw there was nowhere to camp so then it was really creepy it's like what the hell was that so it was pretty neat finding those guys uh, Bigfoot sighting report that heard the same type of vocalizations 
around some moose. Yep, I'm looking for squat, so I'm not flipping around for a moose. No, nope, but I bet you that's <laughs> what that was. I believe we got five game cameras to service. That first week of June, that one time when we brought Mark Crooks up here, there was a... And you brought your Suburban up here? Yeah. There was a big old moose on the side of the road. Yeah, not too far from where we are. He comes from an area where there's no moose. He actually uh, lived down uh, in Tucson, I believe it was. And he thought we were full of crap when we're like, there's a moose. <laughs> yeah, you never seen one. You don't believe in such a thing. <laughs> Good dude. Uh huh. Yeah, he has a uh, property now south of Missoula, Montana, I believe it is. Bought like 20 acres, told us we can camp on it anytime we'd like. I told him, I go, well, we like that area, so we might take you up on that. Absolutely. I was in Montana a month ago. And last Monday, one of the areas Jenny and I uh, scouted around and hiked around in, south of Virginia City, uh, I think it's called the Gravelly Mountains, three elk hunters got attacked by a grizzly bear on Monday. Uh, two of them at 7.30 a.m. were uh, mauled by a grizzly. and they were able to get themselves to a hospital and get medical attention. They drove themselves. And then later on that day at 6 p.m. in the afternoon, a mile or two away from where they got attacked, another elk hunter got attacked by a grizzly bear, and that guy had to be transported by ambulance. All three survived, and of course they, they believe it's probably the same grizzly. They still have not found the culprit grizzly that has attacked these people but I was looking at that report and I was like Jenny and I hiked around Ennis Lake in that same area definitely grizzly country all of Montana they would probably have them here Christmas Meadows Utah and the UN as I know I've seen grizzly tracks there in the mud Even the uh, biggest black bears, their uh, claws usually only get about an inch, inch and a half long. And when you're looking at claws three inches or better, that's usually a good indication you're dealing with a grizzly. I believe a grizzly has longer claws than even a polar bear. saw that moose. Right on this bend, huh? Yeah. Yep, there is still snow. Get up here, just little remnants of it, but it absolutely snowed. I've actually driven back on a couple of inches of uh, hard packed snow to service cameras before. And then, uh, Last year, in October, Jenny and I tried getting back here to... In October? Yeah, the end of October, Jenny and I drove back here to service cameras and we didn't make it to a single camera. It was so slick and snotty and... And, yeah, I, I, and then these guys coming out in a big dually truck pulling a horse trailer. They had chains on and they were having a hard time and... Uh, I pulled over so they could get past, and they looked at me like I was freaking nuts. <laughs> They're like, what and uh, <laughs> just the look on their faces, I was like, oh yeah. We're turning around. 
Yeah, and I could tell they were they were struggling. We didn't have chains, and so they were also pulling a horse trailer too. And what was going through my mind was, you know, the the year or two before that I come back in snow and had no problem. I was thinking it'd be the same, but that was hard packs, and this was snotty and melting and mud. So yeah, I'd rather deal with the hard pack than the snotty mud. So I didn't get the last service of the season like I wanted. But some of those cameras, the batteries can last an entire year in the right conditions. And we usually can't get in there until uh, July. So right now it's the end of September going into October. We surface them now, they'll be fine. Some of these dirt roads look like they're pretty dry. Oh, I see moisture on that one. Yeah, definitely a puddle on it, but mostly dry. Make the lays. I'm surprised these aspen and birch trees up here haven't changed. They're getting ready They're starting to. A little bit of yellow leaf. Jenny and I talk about camping at this camp site right here every year. Never make it. We always have more plans than we can accomplish any given season. And I don't... If you guys watch our channel a lot, you can see we're out there all the time and our schedule that we make is more ambitious than what we can complete even though we're out there all the time I actually uh, found a lake out by uh, Elko, Nevada that I want to go big footing at I can't recall the name of the lake off the top of my head, but I know there's uh, Bigfoot sightings around it. I started scoping the area out. It's between there and Jarbidge, or? I think it's the other direction. But I started scoping the area out because of this Bigfoot sighting. I'm like, what? There's Bigfoot sightings there, blah, blah, blah. And I start looking at the area, and I'm like, yeah. And the winters aren't that bad in that area. It is only 49 degrees out here. A little bit nippy. Sounds like you got your struts fixed, for sure. Yep. I don't hear the noise. New struts, new shocks. Excellent. Yep, I had warranty on them and they didn't want to change them. The dude told me, he goes, yeah, we usually don't do the warranty on those until they're totally shot and I'm like well that's fine but I'm not leaving until you get the rattling clanking fixed after all their lifetime warranty and grabs his boss and a couple of mechanics and they go out and mess around with them for about 10 minutes and come back in they're like yeah we decided the only way to get that to stop is to change them and I'm like that's what I thought <laughs> Gotta keep all the dust down because yeah. it is still still wet and cool. Damp. Cool, definitely cool. Yep, it's gotten cold enough. We ain't gonna have to worry about mosquitoes. They should all be dead. Little bastards. Hey, little squirrel, buddy. Oh my gosh, it's cold. Nice thing is when it cools down like this, it, the animals will get active during the daytime. Well, good day to see animals and uh, the animals are active. Hopefully Bigfoot would be too. And it's the bow hunt. Well, hopefully bow hunters are up here pushing 
the Bigfoot around for us. That last expedition uh, that we went on to the Palisades and the Tetons, that Jenny messed up her back. Yeah, she said she heard it. Yeah, she's been sore all week. Um, she blames it on the dirt roads, and I know the driving on these rough dirt roads ain't good on your back, but no. um, when we were uh, back behind Palisades on that hike, I saw her slip and almost fall down, and the way she had to throw her back and stuff to catch herself, I, I think I called it right there. I was like, oh, be careful. Does that look like you threw your back out? Oh, no, I'm fine. And then uh, several hours later, she was complaining about her back, and I, I think I watched her throw it out. And then, of course, all the dirt roads we drove on didn't help after she injured it. Yeah, we definitely uh, were on some serious dirt roadage, man. I'll tell you what, I've had many seasons where I've messed up my back hiking the dirt roads and everything so it adds up this stuff is punishing and but also I think it's also good for us helps us stay in better shape than we might normally be in yeah I jacked myself up when we were down in Arizona on the Mogian rim did you hurt your back then yeah I jacked myself up hard I know, I know that you went back early on one of our yeah. hikes because of it. When, uh, when we were going back to those waterfalls, Fossil I, Creek waterfalls, I made, it, made it to the first one. I just didn't go all the way up. I was hurting. <laughs> I was hurting bad. Yeah, it's no fun. That's for sure. I hurt my back uh, two years in a row, right towards the end of the season. Both years hiking uh, Sasquatch Canyon. I lightened my pack. I I just think I was, you know, we're, we're going on those day hikes, and I think I was just putting too much in my pack. And yeah, oh I, hell, I know I was. After two years in a row, I went through my pack and started started saying, okay, what do I really need for a day expedition? Emergency light on you. Something to and make the a rest fire. Of it, the rest of it. Stays in the vehicle. Stays somewhere where you could actually get back to. Barren mountain lion protection. Yep. There's somebody's horse out there kicking it. Oh. Yep. I see a shepherd's camp. And we got a water truck. Need it up here, man. They're getting close to needing to pull their uh, grazing animals out of here. Well, obviously, they, uh, they have 45 days. <laughs> then they have to be out of here for sure. Yeah, that doesn't... I smell campfires. I love the spring up here, man. You get so many pretty flowers and stuff. The whole hillside just lights up with colors. Yeah, I see everything looks like it's going to seed. Yep. God, it just smells amazing up here. Wow, there's something that smells really strong. Yeah. Can't quite put my finger on it. I wonder if it's uh wonder if it's sagebrush going to seed. I think it's I think it's a mixture of all the moisture and the seat up the heat coming back up. On the top. Yep. We're about 9,500 feet. Okay, we're 9,000 feet. But the top is 9,500 feet, though. But yeah, the, At the least road. The, highest the road where been. above our cameras, the dirt road is, looks like it's 9,000 feet. I don't care who you are, that's high. I guess unless you live in the Himalayas. Okay, we're dropping down in to one of the more recent Bigfoot sightings in the area. We did a, a witness interview at the location. We'll put a link to that in the description of this video.
throttling up, just making the engine. What the hell did he bring up here? Um, he was up here camping with the, his girlfriend at the time. Oh. And they went on a. I knew he was with his right. girlfriend. I just didn't realize it was an old muscle car or something. I figured he was just in a jeep or something. I don't know. We'll that's have to go back right up the here on the left, yeah. though. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this bend on the left, he put his lights on it, and then he wanted he was, like he wanted to stick around, and he was coming up this road right, right. here at the bend, and uh, right just to the left of us. Yep. He put both of his headlights on it, and standing up there about 50 feet. Yeah, and it was a big one. Um, we did size comparisons with them, and it was about a nine footer. It was double the size of Derek. Yeah, it was big. Derek was our bobo that day. <laughs> <laughs> he went up and did the size comparison, but yeah, um, I'm looking at the branch that it was standing under. It was huge. And by the way, branches do not grow up with trees. Where they form is where they stay. The trees grow from the top. So it doesn't, regardless of how old this siding was, that branch will always be about the same level, pretty damn close. He wanted to stop the car and back up to observe it again, and the girl he was with freaked out and said, "Just keep going, keep going, get get, get out of here." And then, yeah, and then he wasn't going. he wasn't driving fast enough. She kept on wanting to drive away faster, so. So that means they both got a good look at it. He says it had a pissed off look on its face. So maybe Bigfoot has RBF or him revving laying on that, that motor of that. I, I know whatever it was had like a 350 in it. Maybe, I don't know, we'll have to go back and look at the report. Maybe it wasn't a muscle car, maybe it was a muscle truck. Who knows? But yeah. Great camouflage technique and just hope that they're you're not they're not you're not really seeing them they will freeze in place so as soon as those up lights hit him the Bigfoot man just froze because he says it was just standing there staring at him and then you know he drove past the tree to where he couldn't see it anymore and stopped and like wanted to go back and take a look again and that girl was having none of it and of course when she started freaking out fear is contagious I have to say that right now. Fear is contagious, and so that got him going. What's up? Hey. A lot of the sightings up here where we have our cameras, uh, a lot of them describe the same color Bigfoot um, like burnt black like a burnt stump color and uh, this guy Austin him and his dad right where we have a couple of cameras they saw it crawling in the wash him and his dad were up here deer hunting so of course they're scanning watching paying attention to everything and they see a bear down moving slowly inside a wash using the wash's cover so they completely stopped the vehicle and stat, sat and stared at it you know hey a bear you know that's exciting whether you're deer hunting or not and they sat there and started observing it well must have made it nervous because eventually it stood up walked out of the wash up the mountain into the tree line and uh, he estimates they probably observed, observed it for about a minute and a half from the time they first saw it to where it finally stood up and walked off and it was the, the burnt black color and then uh, one of the springs that we have a camera nearby that wash uh, an archery hunter saw the Bigfoot sitting in the spring one year when the spring was really low and uh, it was picking uh, water weeds out of the spring you know just to bring up a point about you know the two with it walking down there by that spring sad note so I was just got done filming the squawk that sighting report had taken the drone up over top of that whole area 
exactly where it was probably about a good you know probably three quarters of a mile square that I had just just canvassed with the drone squawk and that's the exact same day I lost all that footage lost squawk and everything up here about another mile and a half in that was a giant six blade drone that drone is as big as my uh, kitchen table we set it up on the kitchen table and it barely fits on that and every one of the blades hits the circumference of that round table Jenny and I have uh, that was a giant drone Derek actually rebuilt from the ground up the same exact replica drone of squawk after it flew off yeah that wasn't pilot error that was uh, software error the the, so the recovery software on that was yeah, bugged. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't. Derek didn't realize didn't it was bugged. Didn't return to home, damn it. No. We spent <laughs> three weeks, we kept coming up here hunting for it, and uh, I, I felt like it, it served a double purpose, find the drone, one, and it, it forced us to explore more of the area, you know, looking for Bigfoot evidence. As a matter of fact, one of the times we was up looking for squawk, I found Bigfoot tracks, 16 inches. Yeah. But, um, and then it rained, which would have ruined it, but the SD card had such valuable footage to us that we still kept looking for it and don't know where it went. Yeah, man. so if anybody's up here, has a GoPro on it, you can't miss the drone. Like the GoPro said. will still be good. <laughs> the do. GoPro's in a waterproof case, unless it's shattered. <laughs> I don't know. Those GoPro's uh, cases are really nice cases. They're made for. It was Trey. The it girls. was just Trey that saw the the yeah, squatch, but freaking I come up. I come up right after that happened and found Bigfoot tracks where Trey saw it. I I heard it actually go around our camp. Once he freaked out, and I stood up. It. I heard it. I heard it moving through the brush, and it walked all the way around, almost like about a 180 around our camp and took off out in the bushes. I never could get a light on it. All I had was my damn flashlight on me. They were camping in a spot where my we get- My cell phone on me. Not a flashlight, my cell phone. They were camping in a spot where we get a ton of uh, wood knocks. And, and we're not like Finding Bigfoot and some of these other uh, um, YouTube Bigfoot channels where we go up and pound on trees. We just don't do that. Every now and then, a couple here and there. Only time I ever do it is in response when I hear them, and then even rarely that. Yes, I'm saying we have done it, but we we're not into that. I mean, you you see yeah, some of these other guys, and that's that's, that, that, that's their main thing. Sure. Let's go up and beat the hell out of a tree, see if anything responds. We don't do that. We don't make a lot of calls. Okay, so this campsite that we always stay in, we've gotten tons of wood knocks without soliciting them, and the, it's creepy. The creepy thing about the wood knocks is it, they usually always seem in response to something that we're doing in camp. Like uh, the very first one I ever heard, I popped a um, tent spike into the ground. And the ground was soft, so I only took one hit. I shoved it in as far as I could, and then with the mallet, pop, stood up, and immediately a wood knock. I'm like, what the hell? And then sometimes uh, closing a car door, a second or two later, wood knock stuff like that or are just random bam wood knock and sometimes it's one two but it's usually just one and that campsite always gets them it did for years and then uh after uh derek and his family's ordeal i have not heard a wood knock there once since um you know what i i mean it was almost an instantaneous type thing you know what i mean we had just barely gotten back there we had just barely gotten out. I instantly jumped out and was starting a fire. And uh, the girls were in the tent just changing clothes. I mean, we couldn't have been there longer than five minutes, you know, when that whole thing went down. Like, whatever it was potentially followed us up just out of curiosity of the lights or something. Or it just happened to be in the area when we pulled up. I mean, I, nobody will ever know. But it was quick. You know what I mean? The footprint that um, Jenny and I found when we come up right after it happened, like a day or two later, 
and they left their tent behind to save the this spot so that Jenny and I could camp there the next following week because of what happened. So um, Jenny, actually Derek, it wasn't Jenny, it was Derek, Mike, yeah. and I. Yeah. We brought my trailer up and parked near Derek's tent. And, um, uh, and took and we, the tent down. Yeah, and then uh, right behind the tent where uh, Trey had seen it, there was this deep, deep footprint. It was a couple of inches in, and the ground did not give easily. I, I've jumped up and down next to where the print is, and I'm like, holy crap, it sunk in deep. That's right where it was squatting. Yeah, we'll have to put a link to that video in here. Said it was squatting down on all fours. Um, I like his butt sitting down and his hands right in front of him, staring at us. After everything went down and and everything, they sat around the fire and talked about what had just happened. And I'm that's not, how the video that, starts yeah, out. The video. And then the video ends with our uh, follow-up investigation. Hope you guys enjoyed a look at a Bigfoot sighting hotspot Derek and I got all five cameras serviced now we need to drive the 35 miles of the dirt road out of here if we catch anything cool on the drive out of here we'll make sure we put it at the end of this video keep on watching okay keep on squatching <laughs>